Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network and the UNC Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Thank you so much for being with us today. I want to go over just a few things and then we'll introduce our guest and get started. Uh, so we, we're here for the RN and Allied Health telehealth lecture today. So hopefully you're in the right place. You're definitely here at the right time. Uh, if you are running into any problems whatsoever with the lecture, with seeing things correctly, uh, hearing things, well, you might not know if, if, if the audio isn't working, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll be contacting us right away. You can email us at uncn at unc.edu. You can call or text us at 919-445-1000. Uh, we'll use Poll Everywhere in just a minute, and we'll show you how to use that. Uh, you start that off by sending the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. And you can check us out on the web at unccn.org, Facebook, uh, Twitter. You'll also find on, uh, on uh, the, our website our, our YouTube information. Lots of ways to find out about us. Uh, we're going to use Poll Everywhere, and there are a couple of different ways that you can respond to this. We'll have a quick poll question at the beginning, and then at the end of the lecture, this is where our Q&A comes in. So if you have questions, and we hope you do, you'll go ahead and submit those via Poll Everywhere. If you're on a computer, you just log, you go to pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com forward slash UNCCN, and you'll see the relevant poll or place to ask questions, and you can go ahead and fill that out, and that, that's very straightforward. If you're on a phone, and this is the way most folks uh, join us uh, for Poll Everywhere is via a smartphone, you'll text the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. Only need to do that once today. Once you've done that, it lets you know that you've joined, and then you can respond to this poll, and then later ask questions uh, at the end of the lecture. The question that we're asking today, cancer is associated with an increased risk of sub subsequent cardiovascular disease. Survivors have a, and here's, here's what you need to find the answer to, a blank times risk of heart failure. And is it uh, 10 times, 5.9 times, 6.3 times, 4.8 times? We'll go ahead and get to that actual question in just a moment. Our guest today is Dr. Brian Jensen, and he's an assistant professor of medicine and pharmacology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. Jensen's research interests include heart failure, cardiac hypertrophy, myocardial biology, adrenergic uh, receptor biology, chemotherapeutic cardiotoxic and the, uh, chemotherapeutic cardiotoxicity. And I promise he'll pronounce all of the uh, remaining terminology much more effectively than I did. Uh, his clinical interests include advanced heart failure transplant and LVAD. In 2016, Dr. Jensen was named faculty fellow to the Academy of Educators at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, Dr. Jensen, welcome. So glad Thank to have you. you here today. Thank you. Um, so maybe you can uh, start us off by telling us uh, what led you to, to, to your interests and career in, uh, in oncology cardiology. Sure. Yeah, so I was trained first as a general cardiologist and then did specialized training in heart failure and heart mm -hmm. transplant. And that's what I spend much of my time doing clinically. I think my interest in cardio-oncology started as much as two years ago when I realized that I was seeing a number of patients who had cancer, who had developed heart problems, mostly heart failure in the setting of their treatment for cancer, uh, began to wonder why that was happening. And in parallel with that, and I do have a, a small lab, as you mentioned mm -hmm. early, in parallel with that, I was doing some work in um, animal models and cell culture models to try and understand why some of these new drugs that we used to treat cancer were affecting the heart in the way they were. All right. Well, we look forward to learning more about that. Let's take a look at our poll. Uh, it looks like so far uh, our audience thinks that uh, we're looking at about a, a tenfold uh, increase in, in heart failure. So uh, do you want to uh, let them know what the real answer is now or, or let them uh, watch carefully and, and have that revealed in, in your presentation? Yeah, I know we'll reveal it as it goes. Okay, that sounds, that sounds great. Thank you to those of you who already responded. And uh, if you did that, now you're all set uh, for those questions later. And uh, please you know, jot down your questions or just start texting them in to us via that mechanism, and then we'll get to all of those at the end. I'll turn this over to you. Great. 
And there's the mouse as well for the cursor. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. This is my first time with this forum, so I'm a little bit unaccustomed to speaking to people remotely. I hope I managed to project okay and explain myself reasonably well. So the title of today's talk is Cardio-Oncology, What, Why, and Who? Um, and I think if I'm going to introduce myself as a cardio-oncologist, it probably is reasonable for me to explain what I mean by that, because I can share with you that neither cardiologists nor oncologists have much awareness of this field. So one of the main goals of the talk today is going to be to explain to you what I mean when I say cardio-oncology, and hopefully beyond that to convince you that this is a field of some importance at any rate. Um, let us start with a bit of a geeky joke about what cardio-oncology is not. So um, one of the good things about the heart is that it is one of the organs that is least frequently affected by cancer. In fact, uh, it's extraordinarily rare for a primary cancer to arise in the heart. The most common of those is an atriomyxoma. And if cardio-oncology were a study of atriomyxomas, and hence this were a talk about atriomyxomas, that would be both a very limited field and a really boring talk for you guys. So that's not what this is going to be. Anytime I ask myself a question, I think like most of you, I go to one of two sources, and the first is Dr. Google. And so when you enter cardio-oncology into Dr. Google, what you receive is, it is the intersection of heart conditions and patients who have been treated for cancer. Um, I wasn't sure that this definition satisfied me, and this is my main jumping off point for making this talk, is that I hope to, to provide something of a more satisfying definition. Now, whether or not we know what cardio-oncology is, if you go one step further and ask about cardio-oncology programs, this is what you get. So whether or not we know what cardio-oncology is, there seem to be a lot of people out there who are interested in it. And so maybe I can spend most of my time here explaining why it is that people are, are interested and hence what it is that we do in cardio-oncology. So my other main consultant when I don't know something is PubMed, and it turns out that PubMed has a relatively limited interest in cardio-oncology, only 200 papers published. And I think the main point of this slide here is that it's really only been in the past six or seven years that cardio-oncology has even been a thing at all. And so I think what it is that we do with cardio-oncology and in cardio-oncology and who cardio-oncology patients are is an evolving concept and certainly a recent one. So we have a summit, so we must be a real field, right? If we all get together and meet somewhere, then, then certainly we're a real field. And um, we did that last fall, and it was a tremendously rewarding um, gathering where I learned a lot. Now, coming more locally here, this is the cardio-oncology clinic. And I am the, I am the cardio-oncology clinic. I suppose you would call me the director, but um, the clinic consists largely of me and a wonderful scheduler who helps uh, schedule all of our patients. And by and large, referrals have come here locally from Lineberger at UNC. And here is a, an accounting of the new referrals whom we saw last year. And so in the initial year of the clinic, we saw 95 patients, and I retallied that number recently, and we're up over 100. So at any rate, there, there is some interest in the oncology community here in having their patients' incident heart disease evaluated by someone who, who gives some thought to cancer. The patients whom we see have a wide array of malignancies, just as representative of the patients who are seen here at our cancer center, and I'm sure at yours as well. Um, their cardiac diagnosis, probably most common, uh, asymptomatic LV dysfunction. So the pumping function of the heart has decreased as a result of the cancer treatment. Uh, this can be manifest as heart failure. But I also see people who have coronary artery disease and arrhythmias and people who require evaluation for risk prior to uh, treatment, most commonly stem cell transplant. So we see a wide array of of patients in clinic, which is really interesting and rewarding for me. Um, so broadly speaking, when we think of who these cardio 
cardio-oncology patients are, I think of them in three categories, and I, I have called them, these are my terms, uh, comorbid patients. So a 64-year-old smoker who had coronary disease, had a stent, now gets diagnosed with lung cancer. Obviously, there's a shared risk factor here that's been identified, but the question here for this patient might be, well, what sorts of treatment are are safe given his history of coronary disease and what do we need to do to mitigate whatever risk might be associated with his treatments. Causal, and I'll spend some time talking about causal here, where the cancer or more commonly the treatment of the cancer has led to heart disease. And these are all, by the way, patients whom I've seen in clinics. So this is a 48-year-old woman who had non-Hodgkin lymphoma, who got CHOP and then presented later with heart failure. 63-year-old woman, whom I actually just saw this morning in the hospital, uh, who's being treated with Avastin and presents with refractory high blood pressure. So in both cases here, there's a causal relationship between the cancer therapy and the, the heart disease. And probably the biggest basket of any of these is the survivorship basket. 74-year-old woman, distant history of breast cancer, who now has atrial fibrillation. Two very common diseases. In this case, probably not related. Um, but there are many people, and I'll provide some numbers to back this up, who have both cancer and heart disease. So statistically speaking, to, to reinforce the previous point, uh, heart disease and cancer remain the leading causes of death in the United States, and really nothing else is even close. And I don't know whether to be gratified or dismayed by the fact that heart disease remains in the lead by a little bit. That's largely a credit to the good care that you folks provide for cancer patients. But nevertheless, there are a lot of people with both heart disease and cancer out there. Um, and so we will see them. And there are bound to be even more people, again, as a result of the excellent care that's provided at cancer centers. The number of surviving patients, male and female, both with cancer, is expected to rise significantly in the coming years. And I think that we can take this as an indication that Whatever cardio-oncology is, it is likely to be a growing field. So let's start with a case, and again, this is someone whom I've seen. 45-year-old man comes to clinic. He had childhood Hodgkin lymphoma, got chemotherapy and radiation. He did fairly well, but he says in clinic that he's active, but more recently he's been getting shorter breath when he climbs up stairs or walks a hill. Um, obviously, any number of things could cause that, but because I'm a cardiologist, that's what we'll focus on today. And so the question is, your patient is at increased risk for which of the following cardiac diseases because of this past cancer treatment? No answers expected now, but we will go through each of these possibilities here presently. So um, here is the answer to the question that you guys were asked, and, and this is broken out in a more granular way. So survivors of cancer have a tenfold higher risk of atherosclerosis, so heart artery disease or cerebrovascular disease that causes stroke, almost sixfold higher risk of heart failure, the disease that I primarily treat where the pumping function of the heart is decreased, sixfold increased risk of pericardial disease, and fivefold increased risk of valvular heart disease, either uh, stenosis, meaning blockage of the valve or leakiness of the valve. Uh, so these are pretty staggering numbers. Whoever provided an answer out there was aware that there must be some predisposition. Uh, but I think when I first got into this field, I wasn't aware of, of just how much cancer or probably more appropriately treatment for cancer increases the risk of subsequent heart disease. We're going to focus on a couple of things, anthracycline drugs and high-dose radiation therapy and the risks that each of those confers for development of subsequent cardiovascular disease. Let's start with one particular disease and a common one, so breast cancer. Uh, this is a very large registry, the SEER database, 63,000 women who have breast cancer. And the follow-up here is nine years. And the cause of death here in this mean follow-up of nine years is more commonly cardiovascular disease than breast cancer. And I think if you were to tell me before I started looking into this, or certainly a breast cancer patient who was newly diagnosed, what she was more likely to die of, I think this would come as a bit of a surprise. Now, the, the caveat here is that 
patients who are diagnosed at advanced stages of breast cancer, again, thankfully, a relative minority of the population, their risk of dying of breast cancer is indeed higher. But for the remainder of the population, stage one and two at diagnosis, they are more likely to die of cardiovascular disease than breast cancer. To refer more directly to the patient whom I just presented now and to, to begin to provide an answer. So we're looking now at cardiovascular disease after Hodgkin treatment, and many of these patients were young. Um, 2,500 survivors of Hodgkin disease, 81% of whom got radiation, 30% got anthracyclines, and here this is long-term follow-up, 20 years. What's striking to me is that if you look up here, at the 50% incidence of cardiovascular disease, we reached the 50% incidence of cardiovascular disease within a couple of decades. And for people who were very young when they were diagnosed and treated for Hodgkin disease, this is a strikingly high incidence. Um, certainly this 45-year-old man who a couple of decades ago had gotten treatment is much younger, uh, speaking as a 45-year-old man, much younger than many of the patients who develop heart disease. So, so there clearly is something going on here. And the something that's going on is going on in a number of different respects, meaning that there are a number of different heart diseases that can develop. Now we're focusing on radiation therapy. So um, the risk of developing any cardiovascular disease in this group of patients who had Hodgkin disease is threefold increased for any cardiovascular disease, twofold increase for atherosclerotic disease or coronary artery disease, valve disease sixfold increased in heart, full, heart failure over two, and this is just related to the radiation therapy alone. So I think here to turn back to our question, the answer to that question was, as many of you guessed, I'm sure, all of the above. So receiving radiation to the chest confers an increased risk of many different kinds of cardiovascular disease. Just to show another malignancy, this is not unique to Hodgkin disease. This is a study published in the New England Journal some years ago of Scandinavian women who got radiation therapy for breast cancer, um, where the risk of major coronary events increased about 7.5% for each gray of radiation they got. Um, and there was a synergistic risk for people who had another risk factor for coronary disease, so the traditional ones being high blood pressure or diabetes or high cholesterol um, or age, for that matter, where the risk of developing coronary events after radiation therapy got quite high, uh, even at relatively modest doses. This is a little bit of a one-off that I will go quickly through, I think much less important than the previous slides, but an interesting thing, and um, this is to point out the fact that we don't fully understand everything that radiation does to the heart and has effects that, that are go beyond what those I just described. And um, here is a group of young people uh, who were lymphoma survivors um, who received radiation therapy. And the control group had a resting heart rate of 68, and the treated group had a resting heart rate of 78. And when they exercised the radiation treatment group, their heart rates were higher, and they decayed more slowly than the patients who had not received radiation therapy. And these are young people who had had their treatment some years ago. So there's some durable change in the heart that goes beyond just what we've described already. Um, we don't know fully why this happens. Uh, there are probably a number of different things that radiation therapy does. So there's macrovascular injury, meaning the coronary arteries uh, that get blocked when we have heart attacks. There's microvascular injury, the small vessels that supply blood to the heart muscle. And damage to those can lead to, to heart failure. Um, and then there's pericardium. And I, it, it as far as we can tell, radiation affects all three of those and so, again, can contribute to many different forms of cardiovascular disease. There are some factors that identify higher risk, again, without going at to any significant length about this. A couple of them, at least, are fairly intuitively obvious that if you have radiation to the left side of your chest as opposed to the right side, that your radiation dose to your heart is higher and hence your risk is higher. And of course, the higher the cumulative dose of radiation, the higher the risk. 
This is not to say that radiation therapy is bad. It clearly is not. You all know that. Radiation therapy here in this trial published in The Lancet, that radiation therapy improves breast cancer mortality substantially. So it clearly should be done. One thing that's worth pointing out is that this benefit would be even greater if it weren't attenuated or blunted somewhat by deaths unrelated to cancer. So if we could figure out how to, to minimize the risk of radiation therapy to the heart, that we could improve outcomes even more. And that brings me to my first central point for the talk, which is that cardio-oncology, the point of cardio-oncology is not to point out the hazards of cancer treatment or to scare cancer patients. The point is to help to facilitate treatment and outcomes for cancer patients in a way that we minimize the overall cardiovascular risk and hence, in the long term, optimize outcomes for cancer survivors. That's what we're trying to do. So what do we do about it? And this is a, a consensus guideline and I'm not going to spend much time on it, but suffice it to say that if we are aware that radiation therapy is confers subsequent risk for cardiovascular disease, we should do something to keep our eyes open to that possibility. Here we're talking about doing screening echocardiograms every five years or so, a stress test every five to ten years. I don't want to pretend that I know that these are the right answers. But I do think, and here's a second central point for the talk, I do think that if you leave the talk with any message, it is that you should remember that a history of cancer does confer a, a subsequent risk for cardiovascular disease. And for your 45-year-old man who tells you he's short of breath walking up the hill, his history of cancer probably increases the likelihood that that shortness of breath is related to heart disease above and beyond what might be expected for an otherwise young and healthy man. So what can we do about it? And these are slides that I borrowed from Larry Marks here at UNC, who's really one of the thought leaders in minimizing the risk of radiation-induced cardiovascular disease. Uh, conformal imaging, which I won't pretend to understand, is something that they do that helps to reduce risk. Breath hold or deep inspiration is something that I think we can all understand and something that's practiced and does, does reduce risk. And I have a couple of slides that show exactly why that might be. So these are CT scans of patients and the position of their heart relative to their chest wall um, during exhalation here or during deep inspiration here. And you can see from this image that the apex of the heart, the heart itself, retracts significantly from the chest wall uh, during deep inspiration. The therapeutic relevance of this fact is shown even better here. So this is free breathing, a different section of a CT scan. You can see here this is mapping for RT therapy for radiation. And with free breathing, the heart is uh, impacted by the field. With breath hold, the heart is retracted from the field and hence the likelihood that radiation will affect the heart is substantially decreased. This is something that's commonly practice now. Um, so it is worth being aware that there's increased risk. It's certainly not worth wringing our hands about it. Radiation therapy can and should be a part of ongoing treatment because it improves outcomes. But it's also worth being aware that radiation oncologists are working hard at ways that meaningfully decrease the risk of radiation-induced heart disease going forward. So let's turn our attention to chemotherapy. And we'll start with the class of drugs that's most commonly associated with chemotherapeutic cardiotoxicity, or the, the anthracyclines. Adriamycin, so-called because it was initially isolated from a streptomyces uh, species that was found near the Adriatic Sea. Doxorubicin and donorubicin, which as many of you know, are red in color, or rubies in color, or so named. Uh, these are highly effective drugs, been used for decades to treat many different cancers. Um, many of them are childhood cancers. Um, they have some adverse effects, and the main dose-limiting side effect is cardiotoxicity, and this is a problem that we've known about now for 50 years. So 
Adriamycin or anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity is a dose dependent phenomenon and bear in mind that the cumulative doses that we are giving now by and large fall way down here on this curve. So these extremely high incidences of heart failure after doxorubicin treatment are largely historical in an era when much higher doses were used prior to the recognition of the severity of the dose-related cardiotoxicity. There are some risk factors. Youth or old age, concomitant radiation is a, a particularly important one. Um, and there are some things that we probably can do to prevent it, and I'll talk a bit more about some of those here. A couple that I will not talk about but are being practiced, liposomal preparation. I'm not going to talk about dextrazoxane. Um, surveillance imaging I will touch on. Or neurohormonal blockade I'll talk about a bit, but there's a lot of exciting work being done around here by researchers other than me looking at the effects of exercise and, and whether or not exercise might reduce the likelihood of developing chemotherapeutic cardiotoxicity in the future. This can be and most often is a late onset phenomenon, which is to say that patients develop the cardiomyopathy, develop heart failure from anthracyclines years to even decades after their exposure. But there is increasing awareness that there are acute changes in the heart as well, and here are a couple of studies to support that claim. So this is ejection fraction. The pumping function of the heart is measured in two different ways, one by echocardiogram and one by cardiac MRI. Relatively small number of patients, but you can see that there is a measurable decline in the pumping function of the heart that's highly statistically significant. Uh, early after treatment with anthracyclines. This is measurable as early as a one month after treatment. And so there clearly is something going on acutely in the heart that changes the way it focuses, that it functions. And I have seen in the past six months, I've seen three or four patients in clinic who developed acute or subacute heart failure related to their anthracycline uh, dose. And this was within a month or two after their initial treatment. There's good news on that front, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, risk factors that can increase the likelihood of developing heart failure after anthracyclines, comorbidities, uh, other diseases. Um, hypertension, in particular, and diabetes can increase the risk of developing heart failure after anthracyclines. But on the balance, it looks like you get about a 25% increase in risk of heart failure after getting anthracyclines. Not a small number. And this is derived from this, again, this very large SEER database that I mentioned before. So what do we do about it? Um, here's where it gets a little bit unclear. Um, we could use cardiac imaging. As I showed you earlier, it looks like the ejection fraction does drop fairly quickly in the majority of people who get anthracyclines after their treatment. It's not clear what that means as far as predicting the future. The good news is, as I'll show you in a minute, most people who get acute or subacute anthracycline cardiotoxicity actually recover. And so this is a transient event that probably has very little in the way of clinical importance. We've also looked at using things like BNP or troponins to see whether we could measure injury to the heart and whether that would help us to predict who's going to have uh, anthracycline-induced cardiotoxicity in the the short answer here, without getting any deeper than we need to, is that none of these is really proven effective. So this is not anything that's routinely done these days. One thing that is worth mentioning is that there is some evidence that suggests that if we do find anthracycline-induced cardiomyopathy early, I apologize for this messy slide, um, if we do find it early, and we start prescribing drugs like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, which is what these patients were randomized to, that we really can increase the likelihood that they'll recover. And so if you look here, as I mentioned earlier, there is good news about acute anthracycline cardiotoxicity. Most people who responded to these medications recovered full function of their heart. And so we're talking about upwards of 90% the likelihood of recovery was increased substantially by identifying and treating them early. And so, again, this is uh, one of the goals of, of cardio-oncology, is to identify patients who might be at risk for, for chemotherapeutic cardiotoxicity, to intervene early, to, to prescribe 
heart drugs like beta blockers or ACE inhibitors that, again, hopefully might improve the likelihood of long-term survival. I'm not going to spend any time on this slide here uh, or the next because I want to skip to this one, which is a summary of the data regarding the following question. So if we know that introducing cardioprotective drugs like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, once people have been diagnosed with anthracycline cardiotoxicity, if we know that's good, well, maybe we should give those drugs along with the anthracyclines to prevent the development of cardiomyopathy. Maybe that's the answer. And there have been trials that suggested that, but this is a summary slide summarizing basically all of the, the trials that have examined this possibility. And the, the long and the short of it is that there really isn't enough evidence for us right now to suggest that we should put all of our patients who get anthracyclines directly on beta blockers or ACE inhibitors. These are well-tolerated drugs, but they're not entirely benign. Uh, we may learn in the future that's the right answer, but it's not what we do right now, nor should it be. This is some of my research, which again, given limited time, I'm not going to trouble you with, but this is these are mouse studies that we've done to try and understand a little bit better about what the nature of the acute or subacute injury to the heart is. And just skipping sort of straight to the crux of it, what it looks like happens is that the heart cells themselves are atrophying. So the heart cells are basically muscle cells and the muscle content of these heart cells is decreasing in response to the drug decreasing quite a bit in this case. We've been collaborating with a friend of mine here who's a pathologist, who's a scientist. We think we've identified the protein that causes this. Um, we're working on getting this written up. Um, what's interesting, more interesting probably to you guys than what happens to mice, and certainly more interesting to me as a practicing cardiologist, is it you know, it looks like this happens to people, too. It's not something that is recognized, but there's one small paper out there that used cardiac MRI to show that the size of the heart actually shrinks fairly soon after getting anthracyclines, um, which is surprising um, and begs the question, what can we do about it? Again, hopefully we can do something about it to protect this atrophy. Um, so let's move on. So case number two. 44-year-old woman diagnosed with HER2-positive breast cancer. Gets chemotherapy, which includes adriamycin, then started on Herceptin. For protocol, she has an echocardiogram three months after she starts treatment. And her ejection fraction, which previously was normal at 55 to 60%, is now reduced, albeit mildly, at 45%. She feels fine. Her legs are a little swollen, but otherwise she's doing well. So what should we do? So this starts from the most aggressive option, send her straight to a cardiologist and straight to the cath lab, um, considers whether we should continue the drug, give her some Lasix and recheck in a month, stop the drug immediately because her rejection fraction has dropped, use a MUGA because we just don't believe the echocardiogram, that's not the answer, that's not the answer. Um, or continue the trastuzumab and start treatment with a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor. So this is I would say, particularly early on when I first started the cardio-oncology clinic, I would say about a quarter of the patients whom I saw were people who had dropped their ejection fraction either modestly or more significantly after receiving trastuzumab. And to me, this is one of the most interesting, scientifically interesting stories that's, that's developed in recent years. So this is a blockbuster drug, as you all know, the drug targets the HER2 receptor, the ERB-B2 receptor, serves as an oncogene in a significant number of breast cancer patients. And early trials, HERA, um, showed a 30 to 40 percent reduction in mortality with trastuzumab. It's an absolute game changer, again, as you all know. So the surprising part of this came from the subsequent discovery that uh, up to a quarter of patients who receive trastuzumab or septin have some degree of cardiac dysfunction after that. And in contrast to the anthracyclines, it's not dose dependent. It means it can happen with first dose later. It can happen anytime. 
Thankfully, it's usually reversible and largely asymptomatic, um, but does seem to increase in patients who have gotten anthracyclines as well. There's been a really interesting field of uh, basic science that's emerged out of this um, that I won't spend any time boring you with, but it basically has created this awareness that there are multiple types of cells in the heart and that the the way trastuzumab damages the heart is probably to disable the way that the cells talk to one another, at least one of the ways that they talk to one another. Fascinating. Um, what do we do about it? So to get back to our patient, what do we do about this patient? Her ejection fraction is 45%. That's not good. On the other hand, she's taking a drug that substantially increases her likelihood of long-term survival and cure. Um, so these, again, are guidelines. This is not necessarily truth, but these are the, the guidelines to which we adhere. Um, and the conclusion is we should monitor. We should keep an eye on it. Um, but we should continue the drug unless the ejection fraction really drops. And hers, the patients I showed you, was 45%. Again, a mild decrease in pumping function. If the patient's ejection fraction drops below 40%, which is rare but can happen, then it's probably time to stop the drug. Otherwise, keep the drug going. The benefit of the drug outweighs the mild risk of associated uh, heart failure due to the cardiotoxicity. What we do, though, and there is some evidence to support this practice, is to start these cardioprotective drugs that I mentioned before, the ACE inhibitor or the beta blocker. And again, this is a way for me to highlight the role that I hope I play as a cardio-oncologist, which is to say my, my goal is not to stop treatment. My goal is to facilitate treatment and help people do better. And so this is what we do in the vast majority of cases that we see. This brings up a separate issue, um, and this, is a, this has been a contentious issue at the Global Cardio-Oncology Summit that I mentioned earlier, which is if we know that there's a relatively high incidence of decrease in injection fraction after trastuzumab or after Herceptin, and we know that we have good ways to detect that, meaning an echocardiogram, why shouldn't we just test people monthly, every other week, just to make sure they're not developing this problem? That would detect more cases, but I think the, the smarter argument is not in favor of more frequent screening, largely because monitoring results in delays or discontinuation, which has been clearly shown to decrease the efficacy of the drug. And so if we do an echo on somebody every two to four weeks and the ejection fraction moves from 55 to 48 percent, then we have to stop and scratch our heads and ask what we do about it, whereas I think the evidence is pretty clear that a mild drop in ejection fraction like that is not going to uh, harm long-term outcomes. And so the, the wiser thing to do is to continue this drug, which is known to help. The other issue, which I've seen quite a bit in my clinic, is that once you tell a patient that she has had some decrease in the pumping function of her heart as a result, or probably as a result of a drug that she's received for her breast cancer treatment, it may be hard to convince her to restart it. And that shouldn't be the case, because again, the evidence are very strong that these drugs are beneficial. So, again, it's part of a greater point. More testing does not necessarily equal better care. Every three months seems sufficient. I want to skip this. It's a, the, just a piece of evidence to show that the use of beta blockers, which are shown to be cardioprotective in patients with heart failure, protects against uh, trastuzumab or Herceptin-induced uh, cardiomyopathy as well. So we do have some basis for that practice. This is, again, to get to the question of whether or not we should, if we know that starting beta blockers after people have a drop in their ejection fraction, we ask, should we treat everyone who's taking trastuzumab with a beta blocker or, in this case, an angiotensin receptor blocker, just to prevent the development of the LV dysfunction? The answer here is unequivocally no meaning there's no clear benefit to doing that. So again, I think we should take a, a wait-and-see approach to this, and you treat pa patients only when they develop some problem as a result of their Herceptin treatment. So in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk relatively briefly about some other 
therapies. And I should say that one of the really surprising things about trastuzumab is that in contrast to anthracyclines, which are relatively non-target therapies, the idea behind trastuzumab, and in fact most of the drugs that we use to treat cancer these days, is that they are targeted. They're in some cases exquisitely molecularly targeted to one receptor or maybe two kinases. Um, the idea being that in so doing we can really target the, the receptor or pathway that the tumors need without affecting the body more broadly. And uh, surely you see this in, in so far as patients do tend to tolerate these newer drugs better than they did the older drugs. Nevertheless, we do see some cardiovascular toxicities. And um, one of them for drugs that target VEGF, and here's a, a list of all of the many drugs that do target VEGF. Um, VEGF is really important in tumors because it helps to promote angiogenesis, which helps keep tumors alive. It's also important in blood vessels in the heart because keeping vascular health is important. And so if we disable this pathway, um, we can have effects in blood vessels and heart. And the, the most common one is hypertension. And this is a reference to my patient whom I mentioned at the very beginning, an older woman who's getting a vastin for treatment of ovarian cancer. She's had a real hard time with longstanding hypertension, again, because the blocking of the VEGF pathway, which blocks nitric oxide, leads to increased blood pressure. This is a summary slide from a paper that was published a couple of years ago looking at all different kinds of cardiovascular toxicity in some of these newer kinase inhibitors, which actually, for you guys, really don't feel like they're all that new anymore, probably, but sunitinib, serafinib, um, Avastin, these are, these are relatively newer and targeted drugs. Despite the fact that they're targeted, we're still seeing a fairly high incidence of cardiovascular toxicity. The main one is hypertension, which can usually be readily managed by adding the same antihypertensive drugs that we would use to treat people who have essential hypertension. But there are others, and here the one that I see most commonly in my practice is decreased ejection fraction. So people who develop uh, decreased pumping function and maybe even clinically evident heart failure as a result of receiving these drugs. And I, next week we'll see a woman who's had this happen on serafinib. Uh, this is a slide about the kidney, which I'm going to skip. I'm not a kidney doctor, but these therapies do target the kidneys as well. So there are a number of different reasons why these drugs might affect the cardiovascular system. Without getting into more detail than is interesting, I'll say that the endothelial cells that line the, the blood vessels are affected by these drugs, these new kinase inhibitor drugs, in a way that increases blood pressure, makes the blood vessels stiffer, and hence increases blood pressure. And there are also receptors that are on the heart muscle cells themselves that are targeted by these new drugs. And so if you're targeting receptors or kinases in the heart muscle cells and, and affecting their function, it stands to reason that could have some adverse effect. And if furthermore you're increasing the blood pressure and making the heart work harder, it's not surprising that some degree of patients do get heart failure as a result. And frankly, it's actually reassuring to see that it's no more than a relatively low number of patients that we see here. So I want to uh, dip briefly into research again, but not for long. Um, this is where a couple of years ago, again, I started seeing patients who were developing uh, cardiomyopathy as a result of treatment with some of these newer drugs, and I was really interested in why that might happen, mostly interested as a doctor. Um, because that's my primary job, but also interested as a scientist, because I don't think any of us fully understood why this was happening. Um, and so to investigate this, I collaborated with Gary Johnson, who was the chair of pharmacology here, um, an incredibly smart guy who had developed a way to evaluate the function of a lot of different kinases, a lot of different proteins in the heart at the same time. And so together we treated a number of mice with a number of these different drugs and then used his testing platform, uh, which is called Kinome Profiling, 
to see which, how many kinases were affected by these new kinase inhibitors. And again, these are drugs, in the case of erlotinib, this targets one kinase, EGFR. Um, but this list is intentionally small. There are 80 or so kinases in the heart in each of these drugs that are affected. And so while it's great that these drugs are so targeted, again, very different from anthracyclines and other older chemotherapeutic agents, they still have a lot more effects on a lot more proteins of importance than we had previously appreciated. Um, and in fact, here's a, a summary of all of the kinases that we assayed. You know, between a, a quarter and a third of them were actually affected by these drugs in the heart. We, f we thought this was interesting. Um, this is more along the same lines. I'm going to wrap up soon. I wanted to, to talk about one class of agents that is receiving a fair amount of attention recently and that I've not mentioned recently or today. Um, so this is from a paper in the New England Journal published not too long ago in November. This is a friend of mine who, who saw this woman, 65-year-old woman with metastatic melanoma, presented with atypical chest pain, dyspnea, and fatigue, 12 days after receiving the first dose of her anti-PD-1, nivolumab, and ipilimumab. Um, she was relatively healthy otherwise, other than the melanoma and high blood pressure. And when she came in, forgive me, um, when she came in, she had blood work suggesting that she had a heart attack uh, with elevated troponin, elevated CKMB. Her EKG didn't look like a heart attack. Neither did her echocardiogram. But the diagnosis was made based on some experience with these drugs of myocarditis. And so she was treated with steroids and initially had some problems with complete heart block. And then unfortunately on her second hospital day, developed ventricular tachycardia and shortly thereafter died. So there, there was a post-mortem exam done um, that showed this is the only normal heart muscle here really is this. This is what it should look like these pink ribbons uninterrupted. All of the rest of these are white blood cells that have infiltrated into the heart, causing a massive inflammatory response. Um, and this, the diagnosis in the post-mortem exam was a fulminant myocarditis, so meaning the, the presence of a large number of white blood cells in the heart muscle, uh, causing damage to the heart muscle and, and indeed ultimately causing death. Um, I think this is, again, not to be alarmist. These are incredibly important drugs. They can and should be used going forward. In fact, they should be used more. But it does point out that there are unintended and unforeseen consequences of using these drugs and that we need to begin to think about how we might risk stratify and um, predict who might develop these these potentially deadly complications so that we can look for alternate treatments. Last two slides. Um, there are other drugs that I haven't discussed today, some of them used quite commonly, some of them used less commonly, um, that have adverse reactions related to the cardiovascular system. Um, and I, I think just more broadly speaking, to, to get back to my one of my original points, um, this is not in any way to say that these drugs should not be used. They should. They're effective. They improve outcomes. But it is to say that a history of cancer should increase an in awareness in all of us, cardiologists and non-cardiologists, that treatment for cancer can increase the likelihood of any number of different cardiovascular problems, and it's worth keeping our eyes open uh, for these problems if, they, if and when they do develop. So what is cardio-oncology. So this is a sort of a silly slide, but it highlights the point. This is the definition that I've arrived at. So it's a nascent multidisciplinary field concerned with understanding and managing heart disease in patients who have been or soon will be treated for cancer. Cardiologists, medical oncologists, broader oncology teams, radiation oncologists, basic scientists, I think anyone 
can actively be a cardio oncologist. It just takes an awareness of the problem. And then why, as I said before, the main point here is to facilitate the delivery of optimal care to cancer patients. It's not to interrupt treatment. It's to make sure that we treat patients globally as effectively as we can out of the recognition that cancer treatments are effective and that we will have more and more cancer survivors in the future. Lastly, just an example, a local example of a multidisciplinary cardio-oncology clinic. This is headed by Sasha Tuckman, who came over last year from Duke. Um, and he has established a multidisciplinary clinic caring for patients with amyloid. I'm involved along with Patty Chang here uh, is the cardiology presence, but there are presences from neurology and pulmonary and gastrointestinal and nephrology. So this is a not only a cardio-oncology, but a nephro-oncology and a neuro-oncology clinic. And I think that this is the way to provide good care to patients, is to bring people together from different fields who understand different aspects of their treatment, um, and hopefully, collectively, we will improve outcomes in the long term. So thank you very much. Dr. Jensen, thank you. This is excellent. Yeah, and thank you. A tremendous amount of information about cardio-oncology that I know is going to benefit the clinicians here. Uh, I want to jump over and just uh, remind our guests our audience of how they can submit questions, and then I know I've got a few of my own. Um, you just go ahead and one time, and you may have already done this, text the letters UNCCN to the number or 22333, and after you've done that, you can just go ahead and submit your questions, and we'll look for them up here. Uh, one, of, one of the questions I had talking about patients who've received uh, AC or uh, are, are currently receiving trastuzumab, um, what, are the, what are the symptoms that clinicians might be looking for that say, hey, we need that echocardiogram sooner not, and not at those three-month uh, intervals? No, that's a great question. And I think that, broadly speaking, the symptoms, particularly with those two drugs or classes of drugs that mm -hmm. we would be looking for would be symptoms of heart failure. And the most common symptom associated with heart failure is shortness of breath. So people who feel unnaturally short of breath. Um, people can also feel develop swelling in their legs, mm -hmm. fullness or bloating in their abdomen, uh, difficulty lying flat at night due to shortness of breath. Okay, so all, all things to be looking for in your patients that, that, that might indicate additional interventions. That's right. right. Okay. Um, do, with, with some of the improvements, you know, you talked about with radiation therapy, the, the techniques to uh, distance the, the treatment from the heart, uh, it talked about some of the, the improvements with medications. Do we expect to see a decrease in, in the, the deaths from, from heart disease? Yeah, I think absolutely, and I think that decrease will come primarily from the good work that radiation oncologists do to minimize risk, and mm -hmm. hopefully secondarily down the road from an increased awareness on the part of um, all practitioners and cardiologists in particular that mm -hmm radiation can increase the likelihood of developing subsequent cardiovascular disease, and so we're on our toes to um, test more and treat better. Good. Uh, reminder, if you have those questions, you can also go ahead and submit those to 919-445-1000. Oh, we've got a thanks there, Good, and thank you for that. Um, other questions that you may have? Uh, go ahead and get those in. I know another one I had. You, you talked about with the uh, chemotherapy that, that the direct impact on the heart was often atrophy. Um, with the radiation therapy, is it, is it similar that that's going to be that, that it would be an atrophy of the, of the cells in the heart, or, or is it different in terms of that impact? No, it's a great question. I should I should couch some of this in saying that um, the recognition that anthracyclines cause atrophy is a relatively new one and not broadly accepted. Okay. This is um, some of my own work and carries my own bias, though uh -huh. I do think it's probably true. Uh -huh. um, the um, nature of the damage that radiation does to the heart is probably multifold and it, probably not atrophy like anthracyclines. I think it probably relates to damage to the small blood vessels that supply blood and nutrients to the heart muscle. Okay. Um, it relates to the damage to the larger blood vessels, the main coronary arteries that can develop plaques in them and hence lead to heart attacks. Um, so I think, no, I think that the mechanism of damage is a little bit different. Okay, thank you for, for that.
Um, here's, here's another question I have, and, and I know a lot of the clinicians may be wondering the same thing. Well, are, there, are there things that the patient can do or that they can advise the patient to do in terms of, uh, obviously there are situations where medications, the beta blockers and, and the ACE inhibitors are going to be indicated, but are there lifestyle changes, behaviors, et cetera, that may reduce the, the, the risks that, that they're incurring from radiation and yeah. from chemotherapy? I think... T- Two things. Um, mm-hmm. One is that one of the only things I ask of my patients, be they mm-hmm. cardio-oncology patients or heart failure patients, mm-hmm. is that they, they need to communicate to us. Mm-hmm. If they're feeling differently or poorly, they need to let us know. It's hard to treat a symptom that you're, which you're not aware. Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing is that I do encourage exercise mm-hmm. in this population, and I do in, in all of my heart failure patients, honestly. But in this population in particular, because I think there are there is evolving evidence that exercise helps to minimize the likelihood of developing cardiac complications from chemotherapy. Okay. Um, and there's pretty clear evidence that exercise improves quality of life measures in people sure. who are undergoing cancer sure. treatment. So I think you get uh, two different types of benefit from one relatively simple and risk-free activity. Great. And I see we've got a question. Somebody's saying, can you tell it really along those same lines, uh, more about exercise that is being studied? And, and, are, I, I get, and I guess maybe elaborating, are there, are there, uh, is there research going on separate from some of the great work that, say, Dr. Bottiglini here at UNC or others are doing yeah. with, with exercise and, and outcomes, et cetera, but specific to cardiac disease and and the, the impact of, of cardiac disease with oncology patients. Yeah, you know, I was actually thinking of Claudio primarily when I was talking about the work that was going uh-huh. on here. Uh-huh. There are other people, a, a, a guy named Lee Jones who's up in New York now who's doing mm-hmm. a lot of important work here. I think what we're learning, and this is probably consistent with what we know from heart disease in general, which is that I don't think there's any particular type of exercise that confers protection more than the other. The idea is that being active and the recommendation that the American Heart Association gives is 30 minutes per day, five days a week Mm -hmm. of at least moderate activity um, will decrease risk. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much. I've got just a couple of things for our audience and, and we'll go ahead and conclude. Uh, I, I, and, and we had some more kudos to you. This really was a, a great presentation. Uh, we want to thank uh, the, the North Carolina and the General Assembly for their generous funding of the University Cancer Research Fund and UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center for making this and all the other uh, outreach and education activities possible here with the UNC Cancer Network. I want to acknowledge Mary King, Max Gaynor, and Alan Brown from our team for all the hard work that they're doing to make this possible. Uh, we have some great lectures coming up. Uh, February 22nd, our MedSurge lecture uh, with Dr. Matthew Foster. February 24th, uh, we've got a community lunch and learn on stress management for everyday living with uh, Kelly Morrell and Kelly Kivett. And then March 8th, uh, we've got an RN and Allied Health Lecture Nutrition Update, Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery with Ms. Jennifer Spring. Additionally, I should let you know for that March 8th lecture, uh, we're going to be awarding CDR uh, credit for, for that lecture only. And this is Commission on Dietetic Registration, and this is for nutritionists. So if you know a nutritionist who would benefit from this credit, uh, let them know March 8th. All right. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here. Um, Thank you. Thank you. It's been great.